This year marks the 20th anniversary of the devastating genocide in Rwanda, where over one million people lost their lives over the span of 100 days, April through June 1994. Since then, the country has been on a long journey of healing, reconciliation, and rebuilding. A ministry that helps to bring hope back to Rwanda is the Wellspring Foundation. Watch this. To equip a new generation in Africa to lead their communities and nations into a new future. Every step taken forward tells a story of a great achievement. At the end of the tunnel, freedom lies and destiny awaits. At the end of the letter, a stump promises a happily ever after. We imagined an initiative that would have an impact not only in the schools themselves, but in their wider communities, helping parents meaningfully engage their children's education, creating a supportive home environment in which their children could grow and thrive. Working with local and national government towards seeing vibrant school communities blossom around the country. Providing a model that could work in schools across Rwanda and one day in other African nations, such as neighboring Burundi, the second poorest country in the world. To see 48 schools, over 70,000 students, and 1,200 teachers empowered to bring transformation to their classrooms and renewed hope for their country. You see, Wellspring's work has always been about transformation. Transformation in the lives of Africa's children, Transformation of entire schools in Rwanda and beyond. Transformation for teachers as they invest their lives in a new generation of young people. Joining us now is the CEO of the Wellspring Foundation, Andy Harrington. Welcome, Andy. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. So, Andy, 20 years ago right now, we remember seeing the horrific news reports coming out of Rwanda. Remind us again of the circumstances of what happened during those 100 days? Well, the history of Rwanda um, is quite a complicated history and um, over a period of time, um, Rwanda was changed by a lot of colonial influence, particularly from the Belgians and the Germans. And, and they created two uh, rival factions in order to do the kind of divide and conquer ruling thing that many colonial uh, parties did. And those tensions grew and grew over the years as these two uh, groups clashed with one another. And after independence, uh, one group really was dominated by another. And they're not, we, at the time it was Hutu and Tutsi, and those aren't actually names we use anymore. One of the great things a Rwandan government has done is to say, hey, we're all Rwandans. Mm -hmm. So we're always careful when we use those names, even, even here in interviews. Um, but what happened is as it got towards 1994, when the genocide happened, uh, one group was dominating another, and there had been a lot of violence and oppression, so a number of people had fled the country, there were refugee camps in countries all around uh, the area, Tanzania, Uganda. Um, and as we got towards this time 20 years ago, uh, a number of things coalesced and came together to, to cause this incredibly horrendous uh, outbreak of violence. Uh, radio stations began to, to give propaganda. The school system, the educational system, was being used to teach that propaganda. And so ethnic hatred was extremely intense. Um, and it was triggered by the shooting down of the president's plane, actually. And there's still a lot of controversy as to who shot down the plane. But as a result of that, and with all these tensions and all the things that go into that that we haven't got time to talk about, this paroxysm of violence broke out. And within those three months from April to June, it's estimated that a million people were killed. And I, I work in the education sphere out there, and so it's very important for me to understand that much of that genocide was actually carried out by young people. So the Interarmway, Inter which was the youth wing of uh, the ruling party, uh, had been mobilized. And so you've seen probably pictures on, on TV of, of how it happened, largely with machetes, but lots of other ways people were killed horrifically as well. Um, and largely carried out by young people who had been brainwashed to believe that this was the, the way forward. So it was, it was a horrendous time and hard to believe it's only 20 years ago that that happened because I remember the pictures like yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At that time, the, uh, the leader of the UN peacekeeping force was a Canadian, Romeo Dallaire, and he's been in the Canadian Senate, but just a, a recent newspaper article, he, he just um, announced that he is stepping down from the Senate. He wants to focus on humanitarian uh, concerns, and he, he writes, uh, I live every day what I lived 20 years ago, yeah. and it's as if it was this morning. You can walk away, you can't walk away from that scale of destruction. 
And of course, his story was told in the, the book Shake Hands with the Devil, mm -hmm. it's a spider documentary, and, and the movie Hotel Rwanda that many mm -hmm. may have seen. And, uh, and he's been so impacted by it. And you had an opportunity to meet him. I did, actually, just a few weeks ago in Vancouver. I, I, he came and spoke at the BC uh, prayer breakfast. Mm. Um, and just afterwards, I had an opportunity to uh, ask him a question in a large forum and caused us to have a conversation afterwards. And, and we're even having conversations about way in which our organizations can link. He's very engaged in uh, prevention of child soldiers uh, and the initiatives around that re-education and reintegration. Um, and he actually said something that day that I thought was fascinating and it really resonates with who I am and why I do what I do. Because he said, there is, there is no difference in humans. All humans are special. And I think what we can think sometimes, is, especially when you think of, of something like the genocide in Rwanda, you can, you can depersonalize that. You can think about that happens to the others, to them, and the others cause that. And mm -hmm. if we weren't like them, we could be better. And, and actually, there is no other. There's just us. There are, there are human beings all over the world. It doesn't matter the color of our skin, the ethnic place we come from, for Canadian or Rwandan, what happened there was atrocious and it happened to our fellow human beings. And as, as a Christian, I, I couldn't help but be concerned about that at the time. I was actually, at the time, engaged in, a, in working in a place where another genocide was happening in, in Bosnia. So it was really very close to my heart at the time. I never dreamed I'd actually be involved in Rwanda, but when Romeo Dallaire said that, you, and you see in his eyes what it cost him to actually witness what happened there, it brings it home to you, the incredible devastation, the scale of that devastation that happened and how we're all affected by that. We're all implicated and affected by what happened in Rwanda. Absolutely. Right. You know, Hollywood really brought it to the forefront mm. when they did make the movie Hotel Rwanda. We saw that yeah. movie. Mm. And uh, for many people, that's kind of the image of Rwanda we carry forward with us. Mm. But a lot has happened in that country over the last 20 years. What's happened? Yeah, uh, so um, after the genocide, um, the, pre the current president, Paul Kagame, uh, took over, and uh, he has worked very, very hard uh, to, to really um, heal some of the wounds that were there. Now, the reality of the situation is that you don't heal wounds that quickly. You don't just pass a magic wand and say, okay, there's no Hutu or Tutsi, there's just a Rwandan, and it all gets covered up. So underneath, we come across people with scars all the time. But the government's worked really hard, and NGOs have worked very hard, and the people of Rwanda have worked very hard. Um, to say we, we have to move on from this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and actually I have a very good friend, a Rwandan friend um, called John Baptiste. He's the head of Youth for Christ in Rwanda. I first got involved in Rwanda because I used to w work for Youth for Christ. I started a, a project over there called the Elevation Project supporting um, Rwanda YC. And I remember him coming and talking to our team in Vancouver at the time. And, and we asked him, what's it like over there? And he said, you know what? He said, we stood on the pit of hell and we looked in. And we never want to go back there again because we know how bad that looks. And, and he actually said to me, I think it's harder for you to be a Christian in Vancouver, where I live, because he'd been there for three days by then and he'd seen some of Vancouver, than it is for me to be in Rwanda because I know what hell looks like and I'm not going there again. Mm. Mm. So there has been quite a, a change happened. It's actually one of the fastest developing countries in Africa at the moment. It has some of the, the, the least corrupt officials in, uh, in Africa. It does very well on the UN corruption scale. Um, it's a very easy place to do business in many ways. You still deal with bureaucracy in a way that we perhaps don't over here, and you still come up against things that you think, well, why would that happen? But, but it's a great place to be, and it's a, it's a place to, for me, it's a place to meet God. I meet God there in a very profound way. What is the Wellspring Foundation uh, doing there in Rwanda to bring continued hope? Well, um, our foundation started 10 years ago, so it's the 20th anniversary of the genocide. It's the 10th anniversary of Wellspring. Um, started by my two friends, Richard and, and Jeff, who were on a safari, happened to travel through Rwanda. Um, Jeff's father was a pastor in Rwanda. And uh, as they came through, God spoke to them in the, in the couple of weeks they spent there. And really, their, their focus became on building a school. At that time, things were still pretty destroyed and devastated. So they came home, they decided to build this school. Two young guys, still at Trinity Western University, managed to raise the money and over a period of years have built this school, the Wellspring Academy, that's now one of the top performing schools in the country. We've just won all sorts of awards. But, but a few years back, rather than doing the original plan of deciding to say, we'll build more schools, we recognized that the public education system already was containing tens, hundreds of thousands of children. And it was failing, it failing in a really quite bad way. 
So Rwandan teachers are some of the poorest paid teachers in uh, Africa. Um, many of them are still devastated by what they saw. I have friends who walk past the decomposing bodies of their parents and couldn't actually acknowledge that because if they acknowledge that, they may have been murdered themselves. These stuff, this stuff goes in. Mm. And so teachers were um, acting out of that experience. There's a lot of abuse that would go on in classrooms. The training wasn't very good. There were some very unqualified teachers. There was um, a, a massive problem, and still is a, a problem actually, of absence, drunkenness, um, lots of things going on. Often information would be withheld in classes because they were so poorly paid. They would say to parents, hey, if you want this information for your child, we'll privately tutor you later on. Mm. So the Wellspring Foundation decided that the best way for us to help the, the nation as Christians was to actually integrate into the public education system as well. So we started a thing called the School Development Program. And to cut a long story short, that has now grown to 48 schools. We've been given one of the 30 school districts in Ru Rwanda, the Gasabu district. We're in every school there. We have a team, a fan fabulous team of Rwandan trainers that we've trained up. Mm. We work with leaders in the school. We work with 25% of the, the teaching body. And we see transformation happen in these schools by the program that we set up, which is a very advanced program, but, but it's uh, about making vibrant school communities. So we've seen a lot of change there. How are, are, uh, are you able to share the love of Jesus in that context yeah. in Rwanda? So it's in two ways. Our, school, our own school is a Christian school. It's based on Christian values. We very much teach the gospel there as part of what we do. Um, also, one of the first things we do with teachers when we work with them is we put them through a personal development workshop that's very much founded on the gospel. So if you really want to see healing and transformation and reconciliation, you don't start by saying, hey, shake hands and be nice. You start by talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we have remarkable stories of people who've been through that workshop and have met Jesus. One is a, a gentleman I, I met last year. His name's Ernest. He's a teacher in a school um, in the Gasabo district. And he had been quite violent in his lessons. He had been quite abusive. He had not cared for the kids. He had acted out of what he knew. It's perfectly understandable. Came to our workshop, really heard what the gospel is, and also learned some ways in which he could minister it into others. And one of the things he did was he went back into the school and there had been a girl there that um, had been, was very bright, but her parents had fallen onto hard times and basically she'd left the school uh, and she'd become a prostitute. She was hanging out in an area in Kigali, the capital, where trucks uh, come and she was working with the truckers. It was a horrible story. One of the things that happened to him during this time was he got this incredible burden for the, this girl. And so he went to the parents' house and almost got on his knees and said, I have failed you. I am so, so sorry. If you come back to this school, I will work with you personally and we will get you out of this mess. And she did. Mm -hmm. She gave up on prostitution and now she's the, one of the top performing students in that school, about to graduate and has a future wow. mapped out for her. So the yeah. gospel is imbuing it's, everything we it's do. It's transformational. Absolutely. Isn't it? The gospel of Jesus, the love of God is truly transformational when it is invited, when God is invited into a circumstance, a absolutely. community, a nation, mm. you will see transformation and that's what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. So 20 years ago, right now, uh, that was taking place and it's so great to see you. what yes. has happened since then and, and the mm. hope that continues absolutely. to be poured into that area through yeah. groups like at the Wellspring Foundation. God bless you, Andy, on the ongoing work that you're doing there. And we appreciate you sharing your story with us. Thank you, it's been a privilege to be here with you.